Hello and welcome to Econoday Unplugged on Tuesday, the 21st of April 2020. Mark Pender is stateside and I'm Jeremy Hawkins here in London. Yesterday, so what's that, Monday, May futures contract for West Texas intermediate crude slumped deep into negative territory. Prices at one point around minus $40 a barrel. Yes, that's minus 40. And that's the first time we've ever seen oil go up zero. Now, with the contract due to expire today and storage capacity rapidly running out, a nosedive was partly technical as, quite simply, no one wants to take delivery anymore. Even so, it's uh, the case that, generally speaking, all prices are under pressure. And although UK's Brent benchmark is still around $20 a barrel, that's still a 20-year low. So the clear message is that the OPEC plus deal to cut supply is nothing like large enough to steady a market for which expectations of energy consumption have been slashed due to the coronavirus. Just as well, then, that the Fed is now buying junk bonds because there's not going to be a lot of demand elsewhere for high yield energy debt. Now, without our Asian guru, Brian Jackson, today, we wouldn't normally start the podcast with China. But since the country is at the front of the COVID-19 curve, the data there are getting even more attention than usual. And I guess on the whole, the latest reports have been at least cautiously positive or certainly less negative anyway. Um, GDP then for the first quarter, we had out last Thursday, that was down 9.8% on a quarter on quarter basis or 6.8% year on year. The first ever contraction, but the good news there was it's largely contained in January and February. So March industrial production, that was down just 1.1% on a year. Not great by any means, but nonetheless, compared to the 13.5% slump we saw in January and February, you know, it certainly suggests some kind of improvement taking place there. Similarly, retail sales, uh, they were down 15.8%, so it's still a big decline, but also much better than the 20.5% drop we saw last time round. So at least early days yet, obviously, but there are some cautiously more optimistic signs out of China, which takes us to the US. Mr. Pender, any good news from your side? Uh, any good news? <laughs> yeah, come on, let's well, start on a bright let's note. Let's see. Um, I guess the Chinese news was probably the best news for the U.S., but the problem with that is is that China's customers uh, uh, are suffering right now. So that isn't going to be helping Chinese trade or, or, um, or their economic fundamentals um, as well. It's almost like, the infect, like they're re-importing or they're importing now um, – not a, a virus infection, but you know, an economic uh, uh, delayed, uh, or uh, for them that would be a second wave. There seems to be something similar there. Hopefully, that effect will be limited, and hopefully, economically, um, our effects here in in, the, in Europe and the U.S. will also be, or in North America, will also be somehow limited. It's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, certainly the openings in Germany are a plus, uh, whether that can be, um, replicated elsewhere is definitely in question. The Germans seem to have done an unusually excellent job at protecting themselves and, uh, and, and it's shown by an early economic, um, you know, I'm not sure it's going to be a recovery, but, uh, a reopening. So, Good news is hard to wait. Good news is in short supply, uh, certainly. And uh, we're talking about oil. The you know, it's not just inventory immediate for immediate delivery, it's also inventory. The, you know, the June contract is going to be the front contract mm -hmm. beginning tomorrow, and it's down. Uh, well, it looks like about a 25% to about $15, more than $5. It's down so, um. There is going to be, you know, no rush. Uh, the, you know, the best place we can probably store oil products is in our gas tanks, and they're already full, like our uh, cabinets in the kitchen. So, uh, as far as new demand, it's it's tough. Uh, and we had retail sales last week, and U.S. retail sales, and they fell 8.7 percent in the headline level. But um, the core, the control group, which is a non-discretionary uh, concentration, that's um, uh, an input into consumer spending for GDP, that actually uh, rose very sharply, 1.9%. But uh, it's not going to probably happen in April. We had Red Book this month. We had it just this morning, a weekly uh, retail, um, basically non-discretionary spending uh, reading. And it is in a sharp contraction for a second week. So 
Um, it looks like just a general shutdown uh, for for the consumer, and we and then we had these regional um, Federal Reserve manufacturing reports, and they are absolutely disastrous with uh, really no uh, no uh, respondent in the Philadelphia Fed uh, survey, which is roughly maybe 100 or so a month uh, reporting an increase in new orders. And that is extraordinary. So um, that's, you know, that, um, you know, that is really uh, a shocker and 70% reporting a decline in orders. So there's this shutdown going underway is both on the production side and the demand side. And the longer it goes on, the more uncertain everything is going to become. And, you know, the funny thing about the oil, Jeremy, is that the oil people in the industry weren't really warning about it. You, uh, when you look back, the inventories are high, and Econodate mm-hmm. has been pointing that out for a while. And the last time we had a collapse in oil prices, nothing like this uh, four or five years ago, that created the only uh, small slowing flat line in the manufacturing um, recovery over the last 10 years. So... Uh, this energy uh, issue is going to have a significant impact on the making of equipment, the, you know, pumps and, and tubes and, and all sorts of things like that. So it's going to have a, um, it's uh, all an incredible uh, negative that hopefully will uh, soon be reversed. What's the, the feeling in Europe right now? Is, it, is there, I, there seems to be some of the nations are suffering very badly and someone and others aren't what's the what's the net outlook yeah i thought well so if you go back to the the, the coronavirus is to, to kick off with you mentioned about germany and it's um i mean it's, it's i guess it's good news that they are starting to at least release or, or loosen some of the, the lockdown rules we've had over the last months or so and indeed we can add to that what spain italy denmark austria poland czech republic all those countries are either in the process of starting to ease the uh, the lockdowns or at least they're looking to do so in the next few days or so but you certainly also have countries like the UK and France which have decided against any kind of relaxation for the time being and I think it's you know for those countries such as the UK decided not to do anything yet um, clearly they want to see additional evidence that the coronavirus is under control and they by all means don't feel comfortable that's necessarily the case yet but also I think they're looking at some of these other European countries as test cases quite simply say well you know the UK is under lockdown for at least another three weeks uh the front france is and through to what the middle of may and i think they're going to want to see over coming days and weeks what happens to those countries where the really you know where we starting to see some kind of relaxation of the of the contagion measures so it's, it's going to be quite interesting but as far as the numbers are concerned at this stage well as i've talked about in the past europe tends to lag unfortunately the us with the up-to-date data but what we do have uh car registrations which come out quite early on and just to put that into context some of these numbers really are pretty horrible so for example these are year-on-year figures for the latest car registers for for march um italy was down on the year 85 percent france was down 72 percent germany 38 percent and the uk 44 percent now most of these numbers are well below the kind of figures we saw during the global financial crisis so as an early indication of what's happening to discretionary spending across europe it really does look, you know, well, pretty horrible. Um, we've also had what looking ahead to this week, and I suppose the most important numbers we've had out of Europe for a little while will be the some of the flash survey data for April. Um, in particular, of course, the PMIs, which will be getting on Thursday. It really will be the first sort of proper look at how the economies, consumers, and the supply side have been responding to the lockdown, which was introduced uh, across continental Europe pretty well in the middle of March. I mean, expectations for what they're worth, and as we said before, let's be honest it's anyone's guess at the moment and the flash composite output index for the eurozone as a whole is expected down at 26 after what 29.7 last time so on that in itself would be a new record low it's not going to really surprise anyone i don't suppose if we see something like that but we could still see some kind of reaction let's say if it comes in perhaps below 20 or even as low as 10 i mean really you start wondering just how low these numbers can go now before we start to see any kind of a turnaround well but, uh, we, we yep. had a german uh well, we we're having um, economic um, uh, confidence surveys out of Europe this week, and we had a, a, a you know surprisingly good one. I thought uh, with the as expectations actually recovered 
to a pre-virus level, even though the assessment of the current conditions are completely collapsed. It's, it, what, what did you make of that? Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's interesting. Having sort of you know, talked about uh, all the negatives, which we're expecting to see on Thursday, earlier on today out of Germany, we had the monthly ZEW survey. Now, it should be said at the outset that this is simply a survey of what financial analysts uh, consider to be the current state of a German economy and indeed what they're expecting over the, over the next six months. And it was interesting in a sense we saw this sharp divergence between how they view the economy now um, and that their current conditions index as they call it came in at 91.5 and to put that into context that's a massive 48.4 points short of its reading in March albeit just above the low we saw during the global financial crisis so essentially that means um, the way analysts are looking at how the economy in Germany is performing at the moment they mark down uh, their assessment hugely however um, the counterpoint to that, as you mentioned, expectations were remarkably strong. I mean, having fallen out of bed, in fact, in March, they saw their steepest ever decline. A jump to record 77.7 points. And that puts them at 28.2. And to put that into context, that's just a tick or two above the long term average. So it seems, as far as analysts in Germany are concerned, is that, yes, they're clearly expecting awful numbers out of Germany, as far as April's concerned, and presumably for May as well. But as a result of the anti-coronavirus measures introduced so far, they are starting to see light at the end of a tunnel. So really, it just comes down to a case, you know, are they going to be proved right or are they going to be proved wrong? But um, it is a case of, you know, these are survey expectations of analysts rather than what's actually happening in terms of the you know, consumer sector or the goods producing sector. Well, I'm just looking for good news. I thought that that expectations reading was yeah. Positive. Sorry to disappoint <laughs> you, but I mean you're not far off. To be, let's be honest; it's pretty blooming hard to find any good news at the moment. Um, I mean, UK-wise, well, I'll say spot the good news here as well. We had um, okay. We don't have a, a Bank of England and Bank of England meeting till we get to May the seventh. May the seventh, I should say. But one of the the main guys on the the MPC um, Broadbent, he came out was it yesterday, day before, talking that the um, the office of budgetary responsibility the people responsible for the um, the government's um, public sector borrowing deficit forecasts they forecast we took think last week that we could see second quarter gdp down 35 percent on the quarter and broadbent's come out and said effectively he doesn't think that's unrealistic so you know the bank of england clearly is expecting some fairly horrendous numbers um for the second quarter and perhaps the third quarter as well well so, oil is important to the uk yeah, it's oil, yeah, we're kind of a sort of pseudo petro currency, I suppose. Now, um, oil was most important to the UK what over a decade or so ago. Now, uh, we're in the process now where by and large oil production is winding down. I mean, it's, it still makes a contribution to the economy. And big swings in oil production can certainly distort the industrial production numbers. But yeah, you know, it's not in the same case that where you see a big change in oil prices, you're going to have a hit on, let's say, sterling, as you would do on the Norwegian krona, which is obviously very much um, oil-based currency. But yes, you're right. I mean, it does have an impact on the UK economy. But I think probably the net net of it would be that lower oil prices now are perhaps seen as being more beneficial in the sense it reduces inflation, which ultimately ought to boost consumer spending. Not that that matters at the moment, of course, because consumers are hard finding it difficult to go out and spend in the first place. Yes. Um, well, uh, can I bring up, uh, uh, and this is definitely not good news, but I'm uh, looking at this... Um, at this graph of infection, uh, new cases, and the shape of the graph, um, it was pretty accurately assessed uh, that it would peak in, <clears throat> in early April, in early April, the infection rates. But if you, and I had been looking at other graphs of other, like the Spanish flu and even the Ebola, and um, the descending part of those peaks were very fast. It came right back down. I'm looking at this, and it looks like a very incremental climb, uh, you know, a slowing. It's mm -hmm. not going to be a sudden slowing based on, unless it suddenly does so. 
looks to be, at least at the beginning, a very slight curve downward. Um, which raises the question of attrition for the medical emergency, um, uh, you know, infrastructures and in, uh, everywhere. Um, e- even though the, the rate hasn't, uh, isn't getting, uh, pe- it hasn't peaked, but it could still, uh, new infection rate could still be substantial, even though so slowing. And over a course of period of time, it could prove troubling. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Have you looked at that? Have you looked at the Well, I mean, rate? I... I agree completely, and I think, I mean, yeah, okay, I'm no way whatsoever sort of a scientific expert, but I do think it's appropriate to, you know, to introduce any kind of relaxation of restrictions extremely slowly. We've already seen parts of China having to, you know, reinstigate you know, some kind of control measures, um, and I think the UK government has certainly made it very plain that what really frightens them at the moment is this so-called potential second wave. Now, we've had experts over here suggesting, well, look, you could get as many as six second waves if you like so not just not just one more um so it's a case of how you actually you know contain the virus before you get into that part of the curve but i think in contrast for likes of perhaps sars and ebola the problem with the coronavirus is that it is spread so very easily so there's many more people contracting it the death rate may not be as high as it was with the likes of this obviously spanish flu sars or ebola but you know many many more people are actually con- con- contracting this thing which ultimately leads to you know that it makes it that much harder to try, try and contain it um and I suppose also just the fact that, although you wouldn't know it at the moment, we now live in such a global economy compared to certainly like the, you know, the, the days of Spanish flu, that it's so much more likely to be passed on in the first place. How's the early uh, effects on the NHS? How are they faring? Well, the NHS by and large has, um, uh, it's, it's risky, isn't it, to come out and sort of tempt fate by saying they're getting away with it. The concern over here was that um, the capacity on the NHS, that's our National Health Service in the UK, would be used up um, well before the peak had been reached. Now, whether or not the government's responded quickly enough or not is a, is a separate issue. But so far, there appear to be growing in confidence that the NHS will be able to cope uh, with a peak number of cases. Indeed, the expectation, I think, now is that we're probably pretty well close to the peak and starting to come down a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there are still you know, issues about shortages of personal personal protection equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this global mad scramble, everyone trying to get hold of what mm-hmm. they can in terms of that, the ventilators mm-hmm. and everything else. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, and they've got to be manufactured. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also, you know, the, the pitch of, of labor that the healthcare workers have to do over an extended period of time. And there's always an infection uh, question as well. So it's a pretty daunting uh, thought to be a, a medical care worker right now. It is, and good luck to them. I may certainly more than deserve it. Okay, um, what else have we got? Um, I suppose getting back quickly to the economics, I should mention some potentially interesting stuff out of New Zealand. Um, The uh, head of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand yesterday uh, was intimating that policymakers are considering directly monetizing government debt. So in other words, they'll be directly funding the the public sector deficit in New Zealand. Now, this has come out as just being at this stage, they're just contemplating it, possibly considering it. Uh It's It's not to say, it's a done deal mm. but it's going to be interesting if they actually were to go down that route mm. you know is it kind of opening the proverbial can of worms mm. as far as other central banks well for me it's all hair splitting I, you know I, th- I think the central banks are, have been essentially doing that for the last 12 years so um and uh and that's my own personal view on that so i think that it's inevitable that uh, the central banks and the authorities are in the markets buying everything, not quite everything, uh, certainly not oil, evidently, at least not the Fed. Although, oh, yeah. <laughs> but they could buy the ETFs, you know, USO, yeah. a big ETF. I didn't see what the headline was, but they, they stopped trading. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people going broke when oil goes, you know, minus $40. So, um, and it's and our theory is this, uh, you know, moral hazard with the central banks just, you know, printing money, printing money, printing money. Yeah. And can it if everyone does it at once? I don't know. Let's see what I guess we don't have any. Our toolkits are limited. I'm not sure uh, uh, exactly, you know, 
what to say. Well, so. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I and mean, the problem is we all have all that money, but we're not producing the goods and services on which to spend it in the first place. Ultimately, the monetary should be right. And inflation finally has to go mm-hmm. higher because mm-hmm. too much, you know, too much money t- chasing too few goods. Mm-hmm. There was, um, I think it was Morgan Stanley put out an estimate. Was it today or yesterday? And they reckon that the G7 monetary authorities purchased $1.4 trillion worth of financial assets in just March alone. Amazing. Which gives you an idea of how much you know money is being spent by these central banks to try and keep these um, financial markets mm-hmm. stable. I have one question, and this is about my own perceptions, I think. Now, uh, the U.S. labor market has been falling apart, and we get the weekly jobless claims, which will be coming out Thursday. It's, you know, it's been slowing. You know, but it reached a, a peak quickly, like the in, infection rate. But the, the the backside of this curve is, you know, still five uh, five and a half million, or five millions expected in this com- in, 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 uh, coming on Thursday. Is it is it the U.S. labor market and the Canadians as well? Uh, they also have, uh, uh, you know, catastrophic uh, uh, job losses. Yet when I look at the European data, I don't see it. And when I look at the Asian data, I'm not seeing it yet. Is or is the North American labor market somehow um, keyed to quick turns? I don't know. I mean, certainly I mean, the problem very much with the European labor market is that they are very tardy. So I mean, we've only got February data out of the Eurozone as a whole. And you know, be honest. You know, I mean, the, as we said, the you know the, the nationwide lockdown didn't come into effect until the middle of March. Mm-hmm. So, as far as their numbers are concerned, really, you can sort of take them with a pinch of salt in terms of what they're saying about the future. Mm-hmm. For the UK, again, I mean, the official statistics, um, the International Labour Organization figures, they actually look at you know three monthly periods of data. And in this case, it only runs as far again as February. Now, we do have the so-called claimant count um, unemployment figures in the UK, which are for March, but they're typically measured in the second Thursday or second Tuesday, whichever it is, of, of the month. And the lockdown in the UK didn't come into effect until the 21st of March. So I think I mean, the, the, the most obvious answer to your question, it may not be the complete answer, is that as we stand at the moment, we don't really have any hard data at all on what um, you know, unemplo- and how un- unemployment has been impacted by the coronavirus. But come April time, I think we'll start to see the unemployment numbers in Europe and in the UK just, just going through the roof. What, what about the uh, retailers, the hotel uh, chains, the restaurant chains, have they been announcing layoffs? Are there people who are unemployed? Uh, well, they, they have been, certainly. I mean, news coming out of, you know, particularly, as you said, sort of, you know, the, the, the service sector of the economy is is pretty dire. In fact, it's interesting um, coming out of Primark, um, the big fashion um global chain today and they indicated that sales have gone from 650 million sterling a month to nothing mm. over the last four weeks or so they sold literally nothing and, and, did, they, and, their, and their labor force have they dismissed it or is, well, are they still paying them or? well of course they've got this furloughing sta- uh, policy at the moment um across parts of europe and in the uk whereby the government will pick up to 80 percent of um, pay for staff who are not let go, who are, so who are maintained on the payroll, so they're not actually made um, unemployed per se, but they're no longer paid by the company. So, so long as that, that's helping, well, may well help keep numbers down to some extent, but ultimately you know, we're going to see, you know, what did we see Virgin Australia today announce that they've gone into administration because no one's taking you know, airplanes anymore. So there's just so much of this stuff which is going to come out of the course you know, once we get into the April numbers, I think. Well, how long can the governments fund the furloughing? Well, this takes us perhaps back to New Zealand and uh, yeah, monetization of the debt. Um, at the end of the day, if we're if we're prepared to, you know, mm-hmm. the central bank prepared to come say, okay, you know, we can basically buy what how much ever debt you want to stick out. We'll you know print money and pay you for it. And it can go on and on. Now, mm-hmm. at some point, Zoom, you're talking grade one financial crisis, but it mm-hmm. may come to the case if this thing goes on for so long. That, however, they try to sell it as being temporary monetization, you know, whatever it may be, that will be the course they have to go down. It's also so deeply deflationary that even the inflationary risks from uh, printing money, um, you know, it may limit them or delay their, uh, their what, could, what could, of course, be end up being a catastrophic effect. But we're so <clears throat> deflationary going into this, and this is a completely deflationary event right now. Yeah, I think, I think what's happening yeah. is all prices. If these all prices stay where they are, 
I know you've got taxes and so on to think about in terms of actually getting to the you know the price at the pump, but mm-hmm. nonetheless, this is the last in many ways that the central banks wanted. And this and is your a poor lo- old ECB, which has been trying to get inflation up for however long it is now. That's right. Well, forget about the targets, you know. Oh Talking no, about the two percent target. That is like ancient history. Erase them from 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 our graphs, you know. And that's going to be what happens, yeah, when we finally come out of this coronavirus, what happens to you know, the whole structure of economic policy, be it fiscal, be it monetary, be it whatever, you know, what these policymakers are going to be looking at and trying to do in the future. It's also the structure of the econ- global economy itself is going yeah. to change. You know, there's going to be a, 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 a differences in, in its, you know, basic how it's you know, it, we, I don't think we can go back at least right away unless there's a vaccine very quickly. No, you're right. Um, there's going to be some kind of a permanent pre, you know, virus structure, uh, you know, a labor structure, you know, uh, pr- proportions of employment in different uh, categories. And I think that that's all going to be shaken up. Well, if you want to really end this podcast on some, on some suitably grim news, we found out today that Munich's Oktoberfest, the largest beer festival in the world, has been cancelled for the first time since World War II. And let's be honest, just when you yeah. thought it couldn't get any worse. Right when you need it the most, too. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> OK, then, well, let's call it a day there for this week. Um, on behalf of Mark and myself, as always, thanks uh, for tuning in. Remember to stay up to date with all the financial markets, major movers and shakers through Econoday's global economic calendar. Stay safe and we'll see you next week. Bye for now.